This podcast will talk you through the ups and downs in the entertainment industry. Each and every one of you has a talent, but it's a tough business. People gonna tell you, get a real job. By introducing you to sustainable, moldable methods in a crazy, cutthroat world. Let us harness our willpower and take real action. Don't let it get you down. Join me, brothers and sisters, on a journey through trials and tribulations. Unfake it till you make it. I had... I gained a lot. Um, I really enjoyed that conversation with Dan and I hope you did too if you did please show your support and leave a positive review on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you're listening it's definitely like giving me an electronic hug or kiss so I really thank you for that also you could share it to your friends that think also you could share it with your friends family crew also also please share it with your friends whoever you think would enjoy listening to inspiring guests also 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 please share it with anyone you think also please also please share the show with your friends and family colleagues, anyone that would want. And I thank you for all your support. And again, I thank you, listeners, for all your support. Also, it is the Sunday. Also, at new episodes, also new episodes post every Sunday. And along with that, I have a newsletter. Also, before we go into the episode, I wanted to give a quick thank you to a few reviewers Drew1985, thank you so much, I appreciate that. Janine525, and listener with a 5 and 7 S. You guys, it means a lot to me, thank you. It inspires me to keep the show going. So, much appreciated. This letter, it is free. If you're interested, please subscribe. Go to the site, www. Pleasure meeting you today, All right. Dan. Yeah, no, good to be here, Tony. Thanks. Thanks for coming out. It is Tony, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we literally just met. So yes. I have many questions and I'm happy to be here. And can you give us your elevator pitch? Uh, hi, uh, I am Dan Mervish. I'm co-founder of the Slam Dance Film Festival. I am the author of the Focal Press Rutledge book called The Cheerful Subversive's Guide to Independent Filmmaking. And I am a filmmaker myself. I'm a director, and my most recent film, uh, I've done about four or five features, but my most recent one is called Bernard and Huey, uh, which is in the middle of its theatrical release right now. So, wow. Uh, after playing in 25 festivals in five continents and winning several awards. and uh, Yeah, it's had a good run so far. That's great. When did you complete that? Uh, we Last September, we finally finished it and just started hitting the festival circuit. Um, as soon as we finished and um, and then we got distribution from freestyle releasing which is part of um, Byron Allen's uh, entertainment studios uh, in January and then they put it out um, had its theatrical release starting on June 8th with a 10 city theatrical release initially uh, plus day and date VOD and but then we're we're still rolling it out to you know uh, smaller towns and one-off places and things like that. So, and still going to festivals. We we just won an award in Japan two days ago. Wow! So, yeah. Now you, did, you didn't fly out to Japan to see it. No, but one of my exec producers lives in Japan, and wow. so he went to the festival. That's cool. And then another friend of mine in LA was was involved with the festival, so he just brought me the award yesterday here. At, Congratulations! At the, uh, at the coffee shop where we are, at the Spot Cafe hmm. in Culver City. I have to give them a plug. Um, hmm. And uh, yeah, but the the prize is for best script, and so I'm then going to send it on to um, our our writer, who is Jules Pfeiffer, who's Oscar Pulitzer winning, uh, and now Mount Fuji Atami Film Festival winning screenwriter. Uh, which he's very excited about. He's he's excited that he's big in Japan. That's cool. Yeah. So how, now, can we see this yet? You said it's yeah. So you or? can. So anyone can see it uh, in the U.S. Uh, or North America. That is on iTunes or other VOD. 
Um, if you want to see it in theaters, it's playing in, we're having our New Jersey premiere tonight. As Ooh. a matter of fact, I should remind people, for those of you listening I'll try, to this. I mean, I'm probably yeah. going to get up tomorrow. But. All right. Well, it's also <laughs> playing next week. So okay. uh, at a, a place called the Acme Screening Room in some small town in New Jersey. Uh, but it's, And then it's screening in a couple of weeks in Anchorage, Alaska at the Beartooth uh, uh, Theater. And then in Omaha, in Lincoln, in uh, um, the San Rafael Film Center in Bay Area, so a few other places down the road, but um, but probably the easiest way to watch it now is on iTunes. Great, that sounds unless you great. want to go to Alaska. I, I do. Yeah, who? I just I'm not there yet. Yeah, it's a cool theater. I was I was there in December at a festival. Great, but now it's 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 there. What does creativity mean to you? That's my next question. Uh, what does creativity mean to me? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. What does creativity mean to me? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I would. I, I think it's it's coming with coming up with something from nothing. Uh, I think that's that's the essence of it. Um, well, it's right there in the name, you mm-hmm. know, create. Yeah. Um, and and I think for me specifically, it's 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 very much about coming up with. Not reinventing the wheel, but coming up with a way to make the wheel that no one else has made it before, um, and or to look at the wheel in a, or to get other people to look at the same wheel that they've looked at before, but in a different way. That's a good or through a different lens. That's a good thought. Uh, yeah, because one of the things I've always said that's that I've you know it's taken me a while to figure this out, like is that you know the 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 challenge for independent filmmakers or artists of any kind is that if you use the same metric of success that everyone else is using whatever in whatever field that is number of hits number of views box office number of oscars whatever um you're almost never going to succeed and you'll always feel like a failure so you know it's it's a sisyphean task to get as many you know hits or views or awards as anyone else so you simply need to use a metric and measure your success by some means that no one else is measuring their success Mm. and then everything you do will be successful that's the key that's good key. i like that so it's not really about creativity but it's about how how to measure your creativity i think interesting i just blew your mind didn't i he did yeah that's something. But as we talk, I'll, the, we'll, yeah, let's, we'll, we'll, there will be let's examples, get some examples of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's very cool. I like that. Yeah, because everyone's trying to chase like that, those one or two things, and that's that success. And you know, success is a whole mindset, right? Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. How do you stay creative? How do you get in a mode? Do you have any things you do? Like, let's say you're starting a project in the beginning. Do you like dim the lights and p- bring a fog machine in? Like, what do you do? <laughs> I go to the coffee shop. I go here, the Spot Cafe in Culver City. <laughs> there you go. So you know. Uh, now, why why does that get you? I, well, else? it gets me out of the house, and um, and they usually play the same music over and over and over again. Uh, this is actually different music that we're hearing today, but um, and and the the you know there's always people here, but I've somehow managed to tune them out of my head. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, yeah, I managed to get work done here and, uh, you know, coffee, you know, caffeine translates into adjectives. You know, if you're writing a book, uh, it, it takes the adjectives out if you're writing a screenplay, you know? So, uh, yeah, that seems to work. Hmm. Uh, any most, but also road trips are good. I've definitely come up with screenplay ideas like on road trips before. Hmm. Several times, yeah. Yeah, your brain's not used to what is happening, so yeah. new thoughts will, will Yeah, exactly. Create. And also that sort of that time right before you wake up in the morning, that seems to be like my most creative time, whether they're good th- thoughts or not. But is they're another very way. unique. But that coming. seems to be, yeah, because also that's when you can re- still remember them, you know. Like if you dream something and it's two in the morning, by the time it's seven in the morning, you've forgotten Mm. But if you come up with something like right before your alarm goes off, like, oh, I'll, re- I'll write that one down. You know? mm. uh, nice. So I think that that seems to have been when I've come up with ideas, crazy ideas, mm. but sometimes good ones. Do you have any mantras that, that you like say to yourself 
for uh, I don't know if you're if you're having like a roadblock or something. Do you have anything you're like, all right, let me just say the mantra. Well, not, not so much something I say, but uh, or maybe there is, but I just can't think of it. Um, but something is that you have to have, and I think I do anyway. I have faith in my ability that that I will come up with a better idea later. Uh, mm. w- which you know, so if I'm writing a script, it's like okay, write something down. I will. You know, this is a first draft. There will be second drafts. There will be third drafts. You know, if this is, if I'm editing a film, all right, let's edit it this way, but let's at least get it done first, and then we'll come back. We'll come up with a better Mm. idea, you know, or if I'm storyboarding or coming up with a better idea. So you know, stock comes. Exactly. Yeah, because that will, yeah, perfection is the enemy of the good or whatever. You know, there's someone's had, there's phrases like that. Um, I think that's something that I think comes a little bit with experience like okay I've made a few films I know they get you know I mean there's an old adage there's nothing as as bad as your first cut no what what is it there's nothing as good as your dailies or as bad as your first cut I don't know some director Mm -hmm. said this I don't remember who years ago and and I think it's true with films it's true with writing a script like there's nothing as bad as your first draft Um, but you know but with a little bit of experience you know it will get better that's like great. You, you know, it's a it's a chunk of granite. You're chipping away at it. You chip, 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 and you just have, and you also have to have patience too, or or casting. You know, you mm. ha- like don't just take those, just because an actor is available and they've been on a sitcom. You know, it doesn't mean you have to take them. Mm. It might mean they're good for the role, but you need to be patient and mm-hmm. say, you know what? Yeah, we gotta, we want to make this film, but there will be someone better. I don't know who, but there will be. Were you always a patient person, or did you have to learn that? And if so, how? Yeah, I think it, I think it does come a little bit with with age because I'm old now. I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, no, I wasn't always as patient. Um, but I, you know, I mean, you have to be patient, but also determined. So, for example, when you start a film. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to be mentored by Robert Altman, and one of the things he and, and I still work with his grandson Dana Altman is, is one of my producing partners. And one of the things that, that Bob Altman taught us was was you know when you're starting a movie, set that start date, and and you know tell and stick to it, and just be very determined and stick to that start date, stick to that start date, and then tell everyone the train's leaving the station, and then either they're on or they're off. So it's this. It is this uh, kind of interesting dilemma that you have to be uh, very determined that you're sticking to that date, but at the same time patient that, you know, if the right actor hasn't come along yet and you're three months out from your start date, you'll get a better actor two months out from your start date, and you'll probably get an even better actor one month out because in a bizarre way when it comes to casting, you get better people the closer you get to that start date. But on the other hand, that's a that is, uh, you kind of have to have, you know, non-gender specific balls of steel, you know, to do that because you've mm-hmm. got to be able to stick to the start date, tell out, tell your investors, tell your crew, oh yeah, we don't have our lead actor yet, but we're still moving forward. I mean, yeah, like, and just by it? saying that might, is just going to make you get it. Yeah. Probably. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully. Um, and, the, and everyone's like, wait, what? And you're like, trust me, we will, you know, and you do. Or you don't. <laughs> yeah, but you, you push. And you then just you keep and going forward, yes. and that's it. And, the, and then, you know, and, and so I'm Bernard and Huey. I mean, our start date was April, 4th, April 15th, April 15th, April 15th. And then, and then, sure enough, on October 15th, we started shooting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you also need to know that, okay, it's, this is my arbitrary rule. I can change it. Yeah. You know, so. But it's great to set things, to set things yeah. and push to push. Exactly. Hmm. Wow. So you mentioned the Oscar musical story. I have no idea what that means. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But so I- in 2004, well, actually earlier than that, we, in 2002 or th- uh, three, um, uh, my friends and I shot a real estate musical called Open House. <laughs> well, because no one else was making real estate musicals, and this was after 9-11 <laughs> and, and in times of crisis, America loves to sing. So... <laughs> Uh, and, and also I had learned by this point that, um, uh, from casting another film that, uh, when you're casting American actors, 
and, and this is, a, I think, a distinction between American and British actors, all American actors, almost all of them, got their start in high school. And every high school drama program in America devotes at least half the year to the musical, which means that every actor in America got their start doing musicals. Now, whether they can sing or not sing, doesn't matter. The point is, they all want to sing. Actors love to sing, and they rarely get a chance to sing. Or they got their start on Broadway or off-Broadway, and then they moved to Hollywood or, you know, whatever. The point is, if you make your film a musical, you have a better and stronger chance of getting famous actors in your movie than if your film is not a musical. Wow. So. What an angle. Yeah. So I had, uh, my friend Larry Maddox and I had written this script called Open House, and originally it was not a musical, it was just straightforward comedy, and then, uh, and then after 9-11, we, uh, well, Hollywood, we pitched it to Hollywood Studios, they said, no, it's too small for us, indie studios or production companies said, no, it's too funny for us, and so, and so after 9-11, uh, we said, you know, well, why don't we just, you know, Hollywood is shut down for months anyway, so why don't we just try it as a musical? And just try putting, writing some songs, putting them in there, and we did, and and it worked out. Uh, you know, we were happy with it, and we because we figured we'd have to make this thing on our own for micro budget. You know, anyway, so we may as well. What can we do to get a better cast? We'll make the musical. So we did, and sure enough, that's exactly what happened. We got Anthony Rapp, who had just been in Rent uh, on Broadway. You know, big Broadway star, and of course, that's another real estate musical if you think about it. But this, you know, this is a step up. This is about open houses, not just renting. And, um, but he did it. He was great. Uh, Sally Kellerman, who's an Oscar nominee from, uh, from MASH. And, uh, but she'd been doing cabaret songs for 40 years and hadn't done a musical film since Lost Horizons, which was an epic flop in 1971. So, um, uh, and Anne Magnuson, who's a big, you know, off-Broadway star and had this cult following and a bunch of TV people, um, uh, and anyway, the point was we were able to get this amazing cast on like this film that we were making for like, I think ultimately the budget was forty thousand dollars, or you know. But when we started, it was like ten thousand. We were shooting on mini DV. It was right when Dogma ninety five was kind of the thing. And anyway, we were the first film to use the DVX one hundred, which was a twenty four p yeah. camera. Of course, it looks like the first film that was using a new camera, so we didn't quite know how to use it. But anyway. Uh, but we shot this film, and it was a lot of fun. Um, started playing it at festivals, got into festivals. Uh, audiences liked it. Critics liked it. Um, uh, uh, we all liked it. And, and, of course, distributors were like, wait, what? What is this thing? We don't know how to sell this. Screw you. So we're in this purgatory that a lot of independent filmmakers have where you have a film that you think is halfway decent, but you just can't get distribution for it. And I, and I think there were fewer distribution off, uh, opportunities back then as there are now. Anyway, so like all good Hollywood stories, this one starts with me walking out of the proctologist's office one day, and I'm walking a little funny, and I get this call from my dear friend Ariana Baco, who at the time was the head of acquisitions at Miramax Films. Yeah, this is in 2004. That was a pretty big deal, and I, was, and I knew she'd seen the films. I was like, oh, Ariana, you're calling me on this inauspicious day when I'm walking funny to tell me that you're picking up the film. She goes, what, that piece of crap? No way. I was like, oh, great, you know, so much for my good day. And uh, I said, well, why are you calling me? She says, well, Dan, have you heard about this Oscar category called Oscar for Best Original Musical? Mm. I said, Oscar for Best Original Musical? That's crazy talk. I never heard of such a thing. She says, no, 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 it's a real category that the Academy has. They've just never activated it. I said, what do you mean activated? She says, well, the rules say that in any given year, if there are five original musicals, they activate the category, three of them, wind up getting a nomination and one of them wins. I'm thinking, well, even if I just get a nomination, That's some distributor, odds. yeah, first of all, great odds, 60% <laughs> odds of getting a nomination, and then some distributor who wouldn't want to put Oscar nominee on their poster or their DVD box or whatever. So I said, well, that's terrific. I said, so what, why have we never heard about this? She says, ah, well, the rules are very obscure, so they've never activated the category. There has, the, the, each film has to be a true original musical. It can't be based on a stage play, so Chicago wouldn't have counted. Uh, it, it, you know, Dreamgirls wouldn't have counted. Um, uh, it can't have unoriginal music, so Moulin Rouge, you know, w wouldn't have counted. Um, it has to have at least five original songs by the same songwriting team, and the songs have to tell the story of the movie. They can't just be sort of layered over a soundtrack. Hmm. So 
I said, well, all right. Uh, well, our film, Open House, that totally fit the category. We did. It was totally original for, for film, and we had 12 songs in it, you know, same team, everything. Um, the reason she was calling me is Miramax thought they had two films that were going to be eligible for the category that year, and they were looking for a couple patsies like me to fill out the category that wouldn't get nominated, you know, to be those two that don't get nominated. And I said, well, sure, I'll, I'll go along with this. I'll be Harvey's patsy. You know, what could go wrong with that idea, right? And... Uh, and, 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 and then together we started looking for other films. So this is 2004, and so Trey Parker and Matt Stone had just done Team America World Police. And I knew those guys a little bit through Slam Dance. And, uh, and, and that film had, uh, there was their puppet musical that had six songs. So they were eligible. And we got them and Paramount, which it was a Paramount film, mm. to submit the film. Disney, Disney had an animated film called Home on the Range, which was kind of their last of their big hand-drawn animated films, uh, you know, from the kind of 90s era. And, uh, and the music was by Alan Menken, who already had eight Oscars for like Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, all those, all those movies. And Alan was like, sure, I got room on my mantelpiece for one more Oscar. Yeah, I'll submit. You know, easy peasy. That's another one for him. Um, so we got Disney to, and, and Alan Menken to submit. And then Neil Young, uh, and I'd worked with Neil and his producing partner. They were going to produce an earlier film of mine, actually. But Neil had just directed a film called Greendale, an obscure little film that was sort of based on an album he was doing. But they actually shot the film before the album was released. And that, that made it eligible. Wow. Um, anyway, so we got them to submit. Uh, meanwhile, the two Merrimax films, as it turned out, as the months went on, were not eligible for this category for these various obscure reasons. So they had to drop out. So anyway, so it was me... Uh, Trey and Matt, um, uh, the Disney film, Neil Young's film, and we, we needed one more film. Now, this is August of 2004. The deadline's December 1st at 5 p.m. at the Academy. So I'm like, well, screw it. I'll just make another one. How hard could it be, right? You know, so, but, you know, it, it is, it's hard to make a movie, right? Yeah. You know, it is. Um, and especially a musical, you know. But, yeah, like, but I figured, why not? Why not try? Give it a try. So, um, and, and it was particularly hard because I was still on the festival circuit with, with Open House, the, our real estate musical. Um, but I was going to Oldenburg, which is a festival in Germany uh, that I've been to several times. And I'm friends with the guy who runs the festival. And one of my actors was coming with me from Open House. My producing partner was coming. We knew that they always get a lot of big uh, German actors and German rock stars that go there. So we thought, why don't we just shoot it in Germany? We're going there in two weeks. Uh, you know, our flights are covered already. We'll just extend the trip by a few extra days in Hamburg. And um, so we came up with an improvisable storyline. We wrote a dozen songs in two weeks. Uh, I borrowed a, another friend's DVX 100, you know, the camera and a friend's Sennheiser mic, just like these. And, um, and that was the crew. That was me, you know. And, um, and then the Germans assigned us uh, the, ca the German cast and... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but the trick was, you know, so we were going to be there for nine days. The trick was we couldn't make it too good. We needed our own patsy. We needed a, <laughs> a, a film that would not take votes away from Open House. So we had nine days to make a bad German musical. Uh, just like the real life version of the producers, of course. You know, so. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So, for example, our, our lead actress, uh, Marika Fell is her name. Very accomplished actress in, in Germany. You know, she, she meets us at the airport. She says, oh, we are so excited to all be winning uh, the Oscar. Uh, for this thing, uh, but uh, the two problems, it's five problems, and I, I said, what could they possibly be? She says, well, I can't sing and I can't improvise, and I said, you're perfect, you know. <laughs> uh, that's exactly what we need. <laughs> so we had all these crazy adventures in Germany. They, we met the biggest pimp in Germany who took us all these S and M clubs, and and the biggest triathlon in Europe was going on in Hamburg there, and the, <clears> you know crazy stories. And, and we come back to LA, slap together a cut of it, and, and on December first at four fifty five p.m. we get to the Academy Building, and their office is on the seventh floor, and the elevator's not working. We're like, oh my gosh, we're running up the stairs, we're running upstairs, we're running upstairs, and finally, <sighs> out of breath, you know, we get to the Academy office. And we've been telling the staff for months what we were going to be doing because they're such sticklers for the rules. We're like, can we really do this? Can we really do this? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what kind of idiot goes to Germany to make a bad German musical? I was like, well, this guy, this idiot, clearly. <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, crap, you guys did it. You pulled it off. You know? wow. And uh, they're like, well, now we got to take it to the Board of Governors. And so three days later, the Board of Governors meets, and it's Tom Hanks and the studio heads, and they all talk like this because it's the Academy, right? You know? And um, they're like, Oscar for Best Original Musical? That's crazy talk. We never heard of such a thing. And the guys on the music branch, it was actually their category. They're like, oops, yeah, no, we did, just didn't think anyone would do it, you know? Wow. So, uh, well, they're like, well, who are we going to give this thing to? You know, Trey and Matt, who showed up in dresses last time, you know, hopped up on acid the last time they were 
nominated. No, those guys are like banned for life. You know, uh, Neil Young, they were pissed at because I think he didn't show up for rehearsals the last time he was nominated for a song for Philadelphia. No, we don't like Neil Young. Alan Menken, he's got too many Oscars already. He's got eight. He's cut off. His mantelpiece is filled. Uh, and this Mervish character, my two films, their combined budgets didn't add up to the cost of an Oscar gift basket. There's no way they're going to get and, and he just told us his film was bad. You know, we're not going to give that a, an award. So they canceled the category. And I was like, what? I know, exactly. Are you kidding? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. They canceled the category. We're like, you're such sticklers for the rules, like in every other case. And we, we exactly followed their rules. And they're like, well, what are you going to do about it, kid? And I was like, well, I'll take umbrage because really what else can you take? And so we got a lot of press. We got, you know, Hollywood Reporter, Variety. Reuters picked up the story. Uh, LA Times, uh, Reuters picked up the story. It ran all over the world. And people saw the story. Based on the press that we got, we got distribution for the film. Interesting. Uh, from a small company called Wellspring that then got sold to another company that then got sold to the Weinstein Company. Miramax had just turned into the Weinstein Company. They put out the DVD. On the back of the box, it says, from the film that changed the rules of the Academy Awards. Wow. And, um, <laughs> and if you think about it, that was the goal. The goal wasn't to win an Oscar. It's to push. It was to get distribution. Get distribution. So wow. that's... That's what I'm saying. Like the the uh, and by the way, and for your listeners, you should know that they then the next year they changed the rules, and they have what they call or what I call the Mervish rule in there now, which says uh, it is at the discretion of the Academy if we want to activate the category based on the quality of the films. Um, <laughs> so they put an out in there for themselves for future years. So anyway, so it literally is the the film that changed the rules of the Academy Awards, and so. Uh, when I say like you measure yourself by other metrics, great example. Everyone else measures themselves by oh, did you win an Oscar? Did you get nominated for an Oscar? Well, even if you get nominated for an Oscar, everyone knows you're a loser. So, um, but nobody measures their success by did the Oscars have to change the rules because of you? Yeah. <laughs> so that's, I'm one of the few people that can claim that. So that's a wonderful story. Damn, I was like, I was thinking, oh man, he he must have. One out of all of them for some reason. Yes. I was like so on the edge of my seat yes. over here. But no, that's that's even better. I mean, I think yeah. that's that's something to like think about where like you push so hard. You made a second movie to get your movie that you cared about, like distribution. That's that's really cool. Yeah. But it also like people always say, Well, why do you make a movie? Well, there's a lot of really stupid reasons to make a movie. And we found one. You know, <laughs> so, so, but, but wow. that's all it takes is it just takes a really good reason to make a movie oh. and then two weeks later you can be shooting it. Yeah. It's like, like it doesn't, what's your reason? What's, yeah. Is it strong? Yeah. Like, oh, there's a location available. Great. Let's shoot. Yeah. It could know? be that or, simple. I love that. Oh, uh, someone loaned you a camera for the weekend. Great. Yeah, that's just a reason try to make out. a movie. Just do you it. Know? So, uh, you know, or Tom Cruise is your next door neighbor and he's like, he's Hey bored. man, I'm available for the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Shoot Tom, Tom Cruise, Cruise movie, movie in two days. Two days. He could do it. He Why could. not? Uh, he does his own stunts. Why not? He can do anything. <laughs> um, but anyway, the point is, like, people get so obsessed with saying no and finding reasons not to do a film. You just need to find one halfway decent reason to make a film and just ignore the other 28 reasons why you shouldn't make it. <laughs> yeah. If and that's what you want to do. If you don't want to make films... Don't make films. It's yeah. not like there's some great magic yeah. there. Like it's you funny. won't get rich, you won't get famous, yeah. you won't get laid. You know, like, <laughs> not a, no. It's, so, it's a, uh, how do we watch those movies? Where would we find those movies? Those or at are least actually one of very them? difficult. Really, to find. Uh, I think the DVD of Open House, because of course the distributor was at the end of the day was Harvey. Not only Harvey Weinstein, because he he bought this company. The Weinstein's I mentioned bought. Company Wellspring, or no, Wellspring had been sold to Genius, so they sort of had this joint operation with this company called Genius Partners. The guy who owned Genius Partners was Steve Bannon. So I was in business with Steve Bannon and Harvey Weinstein, and at one point they called us up and they said, "Oh, the good news is we owe you fifty thousand dollars." I said, "Terrific." I actually knew that they owed us a hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> um, but still, I, you know, you take those. Calls. And they said, that, "I said, what's the bad news? Oh, we're going out of business in two days. Click." And, and then was, you never was, heard from him, never, never got any money? Him. No, no. So Wow. So uh, wait. Everyone's got their Harvey stories. And now, why can't we put this on Amazon? Anyway, we can. Okay. I mean, we? I can. Uh, Are you going to do it? Uh, I would like to do it. Yeah. But then you finding... Let finding, me know. Okay. Uh, I'll 
finding the right aggregator, I was, uh, you know, to get stuff on digital is not, is not as simple as it, mm. I mean, it's simple, but it's not, yeah, no, mm. you just, but also, you know, you get distracted by other projects and other yeah. films. So anyway, so open house, you can still find the, um, the DVD floating around on eBay. Okay. Um, and actually all the DVD extras are on you are on my YouTube channel. And there's and, and including a little mini a short documentary about the whole Oscar story, which if we were smart oh, cool. and I kick myself, we would have submitted that for the short Oscar cat, short Oscar doc category the next year, but I forgot. <laughs> so, uh, but it did play at a couple festivals in and of itself, which well, was okay. kind of nice too, you know. Um, but anyway, so yeah, all the DVD extras are actually all over YouTube. Okay, I'll find and, that and at on least. my own website. Look at, at that, damnmervish.com. But. Um, but yeah, but we, that is on the list is to get, to get the film just available, available. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, even these sort of aggregators that are like, Oh, we'll put it on iTunes and we'll put it on Amazon. If you pay us money, I'm like, wait, what? Yeah, I know that's, well, it's fairly so. simple. If you digitize it, you go to Amazon, literally the follow the steps within one day. I think it could be at least submitted for them to look and check everything off and say, okay, you have your film up, it's ready. Like, yeah. And then you get whatever, a little percent if someone buys it or whatever. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not um, a money thing. It's just the thing that you right. want up. Yeah, you, you want know? up there. Yeah, no, I mean, my first film we got up on, uh, uh, is on Amazon now called Omaha the Movie and we threw an aggregator and, and not only do they owe us money, they actually overpaid us at one point and asked us to pay them back. And we're like, hmm. Hmm. No, I think we should, uh, if you need help finding an accountant, because clearly you need a little bit of help with that, we can do that and audit you. And they're like, no, 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 that's cool. That's hmm. Anyway, but the, the, I just checked the rights to that have just reverted to me because we had a five-year deal with that's that. That's good. And so, hmm. yeah, so if anyone out there is listening who wants to do something with my first couple films, they're available. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I definitely want to look into Open House. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I just... How you painted the picture and, and what you did and the whole thing that went into it that's very cool thanks and you know i'm i'm excited to read your book the cheerful subversive Sh- guide, guide to, to independent, independent filmmaking. filmmaking um i i i actually skimmed through it oh, cool. I, i'm getting ready probably maybe in a month i might dive into it great because i'm finishing another book cool. um but i skimmed through it and i i landed on a funny sentence and it was, it was just cool um, i wrote it down it's called it says if you aren't artistically minded at all or simply have no friends, then what can you do? <laughs> I thought that was just great. So yeah. if anyone feels that way, uh, I'm, there's There's, there's an options. entire chapter on that. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think the chapter title is uh, You're No Genius. Um, Probably. Yeah. You and, that's, and that's actually <laughs> a line from my, uh, not the current film, but the prior one, uh, Between Us, which is based on, a, on an off-Broadway play, a hit off-Broadway play by Joe Hortua, and it's a line that David Harbour, who's now kind of more famous from Stranger Things, says, because mm. uh, he and Tay Diggs play these two um, uh, photographers, and it's about, and there's a line that Harbour says, like, we're no geniuses, you know. Mm. Uh, mm. Yeah, or something, and, and it's about how, as artists, they're not geniuses, and no one ever is, you know. So, um, but... Yeah, but then well, I forget what the line you quoted was. Was you know if you're, uh, then you just need to find friends who are you know, <laughs> or and that's and that's something that I've tried to do in the last couple films is is to collaborate um, you know either with very talented uh, musicians and composers like on the on the musical we um, my friend Larry and I collaborated with uh, Joe Kramer, um, who's went you know he's now a pretty big composer. Um, you know, and we found Anthony Rapp, you know, like to mm-hmm. be yeah, a lead it, it actor. You know, brings your, your own ideas and oh, projects yeah. to that next yeah, level because no, it's a collaborative Yeah, thing. no, he, yeah, he was amazing and really set a great example for the rest of the cast and just elevated everything. Um, and then, you know, on Between Us, uh, that was, you know, I found an off-Broadway play that no one have, was trying to make into a film. Mm-hmm. But, you know, uh, and then on this one, Bernard and Huey, uh, I found a script that was written by an Oscar Pulitzer OB winning Tony nominated writer, Jules Pfeiffer, that mm-hmm. he wrote 30 years ago that had um, been sitting on a shelf for 30 years and no one knew. He didn't even know where it was. You know? <laughs> but I knew that, you know, if you start with good material, you know, 
uh, number one, first and foremost, you can get a good cast. You know, mm. so you either get a good cast by having a musical, or you get a good cast by having sort of a high pedigreed, you know, project, either drama or or kind of a, a dramatic comedy, like I've done these last two films, um, with good parts, long monologues, because actors love monologues, <laughs> and um, but you know that ha- that was written by someone with some some ser- serious credibility. That's how you get the agents to read the scripts. That's how you get the actors interested, and if you get the actors then you can raise the money and you can make the film and get the film out there too. get it into festivals and get ultimately some kind of distribution. Yeah. There's so much involved in that. And, uh, I'm sure I'll have some additional questions in a, in a second, Sure, but I wanted to ask you a little more about the book. Um, yeah. like what inspired you to, to get it done and how <laughs> did you get it done? How did you yeah. finish a book? Right. So the hard part is to start a book. <laughs> so, um, wh- what I did with this one, this is actually my second book. I had also mm. written a, a, or co-wrote a, a satiric novel a few years ago, too, called I Am Martin Eisenstadt, One Man's Wildly Inappropriate Adventures with the Last Republicans, available on, through Farrar Strauss Chiro, and that was a very successful book. Cool. That's a whole other long story, too. But um, with this one, I, when, I was, when we were sort of promoting uh, the film Between Us, um, I did a lot of the best press you write is a pre- the best press you get is a press you write yourself. So I was writing a lot of articles about the making of the film for Filmmaker Magazine, including things like how to cast A-list actors in a micro-budget film. That was one article that is still like one of their top read articles on the Filmmaker website. And um, you know how to get into festivals without going broke, and you know everything from production to post-production to festivals. And I had been thinking, oh, wait, this is, if I sort of add these articles up, it's almost a book. Well, it turns out it's not actually, it's like 40% of a book, but it's, you know, or 50% of a book, but it's, good start. you know, it's a good start. You're not starting on a blank page. Um, and what really happened was what really kind of pushed me over the edge to try to pitch the book was that I'd been working for close to three years trying to find the script to Bernard and Huey. Uh, from Pfeiffer, and, and it's a whole epic story about how um, how we even found the script because uh, he I had just read this article, and so remind, I'll tell a little bit of the story, then remind me to come back to why it's relevant to the book. So I had read an interview with him, um, uh, and of course he he was a, as a, as a cartoonist he had a cartoon in the Village Voice for 44 years. He won a Pulitzer Prize for that. But as a screenwriter, he wrote Carnal Knowledge, the Mike Nichols 1971 film with Jack Nicholson and Art Garfunkel. He wrote um, Popeye, the Robert Altman directed. He wrote Little Murders that Alan Arkin directed. Anyway, but I read this interview with him. Said he's in his 80s, living in the Hamptons, teaching, still writing graphic novels, still very active. But at the very end, it said he had several unproduced screenplays. I just thought it was just like this little throwaway line. I thought, well, whatever they are, they're probably pretty good. So I reached out to him and he got back to me right away. He said, yeah, I think I got some stuff, but everything's in storage. I've been divorced so many times. I don't know where anything is. Try me back in four months. Maybe I'll have something for you. I try him back four months later. Yeah, I still don't know where anything is. Try me back another four months. And, 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 this, and I did. And this went on for a year and a half. He still couldn't find anything. Finally, my, my friend, another filmmaker, uh, Kevin DeNovis, said, oh, I, I think I remember reading one of these screenplays. I said, where? He said, well, in, in the late 90s, there was this magazine called Scenario Magazine that would publish um, mainly completed screenplays, like Big and Indiana Jones, like, you know, the big Hollywood screenplays. But every now and again, they would have an unproduced screenplay. And I said, well, Kevin, would you still have your old copies of the magazine? He goes, no, 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 I just got divorced. Everything's in storage. I don't know where anything is. I was like, great. So I found out the only library in America that still had this magazine was the Academy Library. You know, our friends at the Academy, right? Yeah. This is why you can't, this is why you still have to be nice to them so you don't get banned later on. Um, so they were very nice to me. I went over to their library on La Cienega here in L.A., not far from where I live. And, um, and they had the magazine, and I, and I read Bernard and Huey. And, and there was a little side article that explained the, the genesis of it. It was, it was based on cartoons that go back to 1957. These two characters were Bernard and Huey. Uh, one, Huey was kind of a womanizer. Bernard was his nebbishy best friend. And they were recurring characters um, in, uh, in, in Pfeiffer's cartoons all through 
you know, the 60s, 70s, and in the 80s, he brought them back specifically as a six-page regular panel in the back of Playboy magazine once a month for everyone that was reading it for the cartoons. And, uh, and then based on that, uh, he brought them back as these two middle-aged guys. Uh, he got commissioned by Showtime to write a screenplay. Um, they write, he writes a screenplay, but the week he turns it in, Showtime changed ownership and they didn't pay him for it. And so he and a producing partner, a guy named Michael Brandman, tried to um, sell it as a studio film, and they had no luck whatsoever. And then it sat on a shelf for 30 years. Anyway, so uh, Jules said, oh, yeah, that's the script, Bernard and Huey, that's the one. Uh, he said, but I think, I seem to remember my assistant may have sent that magazine and edited a bridge version of it. What you read may not have been the full thing. I said, well, that's great. Let's call your old assistant. Maybe she's got a floppy disk of it lying around. Oh, no, she's dead. Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry to hear that. That's t terrible news. I said, what about your agent? He must have had, you know, he had a big Hollywood agent. Oh, no, he's dead, too. Oh, my gosh, that's horrible. So well, what about, what about your lawyer? No longer among the counted. He is dead, you know. And um, so we finally tracked down this producer, Michael Brandman, who was still alive, still married, still had his archives. And within a couple of weeks, he was able to find us uh, the finished type version of the script. And then, actually, a couple of months later, we found the original handwritten copy of the script at the Library of Congress in Washington, where Jules had donated some of his archives about a dozen years ago and had kind of forgotten about. It. And so I had a buddy in D.C., and my friend Mike Shubik went to the library and got a copy of, the, of that. Anyway. Then we still had to make sure that Jules really had the rights to this, which as it turns out, he did, but we had to go to Village Voice, we had to go to Playboy, we had to go to Showtime, they all had to look through their archives. Anyway, and then we had to get Jules a new, a new agent, a new, a new lawyer, a new assistant, wow. you know. So, um, so we were getting really close to signing, so this, this is the, here's the part where it gets close. So after like three years of finding the script, doing all the legal clearances, um, we were very close to signing the contract and I was heading to New York with, uh, and it was spring break for my kids and, and I was going to New York uh, like two days earlier before my wife and kids were going to get there for, for vacation. And, uh, and I thought, oh, this is great. I'm going to go. I'm going to sign the contract with Jules. We're going to have a celebration, you know, and, and then we can start making the movie. And then right before I got there, he said, well, there was one little hitch with the contract. And then his, his girlfriend was getting knee replacement surgery. And mm -hmm. anyway, and it looked like I wasn't going to be able to sign the contract mm -hmm. on that trip or even see Jules on that trip. And uh, so I was like, oh, great. Now my wife's going to get pissed at me because I'm going to New York for two days just to have fun. You know, like just to hang out with my slacker filmmaker friends. So I'm like, <laughs> I can't justify that, you know. Um, so I'm like, all right, what else can I do in New York? I know, there's publishers in New York. I'll pitch a book. Hmm. So, that, so I did. So wow. I whipped up a treatment for the book uh, the day before I left, came to New York, started meeting with publishers, sold the book. Hell yeah. Damn. So. <laughs> wait, wait, wait how, can you walk us so through? So again, there through... are many stupid reasons to make a movie. There's <laughs> stupid reasons to make a book too. So can you walk us through how that happened? Like, okay, let, you wrote the treatment. <laughs> And then you feel good about it, and you just what? You looked up uh, people, or did publishers? You, you, yeah, pretty much. You didn't get a referral. It was like literally a look up. Yeah, and yeah, it, calls it was. Or? Yeah, pretty much. Um, well, because for nonfiction film books, there's kind of two ways to go. Either you go through each big publisher publishing house, like will typically do one of those books every couple of years. And then there are a couple, and it really is only a couple, it's like Focal Press and, and one other company that do, um, uh, that specifically do film books for sort of academic and, you know, filmmaker purposes. Um, anyway, so I had, I mentioned I'd already had one book, um, and that was through Farrar Strauss Giroux, which is a pretty serious publisher. So I met with them, because I had a relationship with them mm -hmm. there in New York. Um, and then I literally called the, the two other publishers that just do film books um michael wheezy is the other one i think they were in california the other one was in uh uh focal press was actually the guy i wound up meeting with actually wasn't even in new york he was in boston but we were going to boston as part of the family trip so the guy met me at our hotel uh nice. with the family and um and that and that's who i wound up selling the book to but to pitch a book is actually not that hard you only need and this is true for both fiction and nonfiction. you need a table of contents and you need a chapter well if you've already written articles like 
all I had to do is just say, all right, well, one of these articles, like my casting article, you know, that's a chapter in the book. And then, and then, you know, and then you just need to come up with a ta an organizing principle, a table of contents. Mm -hmm. um, now, for it, as it turns out, for sort of these academic type publishers, um, there's another whole step. Like they say, oh yes, we love it, but then you have to get it peer reviewed. I'm like, what does that mean? Or you get your your proposal peer reviewed. So they actually take that proposal, and they send it out. They send it out to like. 12 or 15 different film school professors around the country oh. some of whom I knew most of them I didn't know and to get their opinion on okay is this relevant is this unique could this, is be, this, something? Could this yeah. be something would you adopt this for your class and so so that takes a couple months and then they come back and they say oh yeah no the response was great they want you know and and then and they were like did they funded or how did that well yeah you get a very small advance okay very small and like then, <laughs> but, and, uh, but did you start right away? I mean, after they yeah. approved, you, you were like, all right, I'm going to just yeah. get this. Yeah, and, and, and uh, exactly. So, yeah, as soon as you get that first check, you're like, well, someone's paying me. Even if I'm it's doing, not much, yeah, i got to do something. Because they, they only give you the second check once you turn in the first draft. Okay. So that's, that's usually that's how it works great. in publishing. Um, but the interesting thing for this particular book was that it then, you know, by then we were starting to work on Bernard and Huey. We were doing a Kickstarter campaign. I had like, nine interns working in my garage in Culver City oh, wow. and um, and and setting up like the LLC and the SEC requirements and things like that and so and those were some of the chapters that I still needed to write for the book so I would literally Perfect. write the book while I was doing figuring it, it out yeah and that like great. and if I couldn't remember how to do the next step oh well maybe I wrote an article about it oh yeah that's a chapter in a book or maybe I need to write a chapter in a book about it so and then during that kind of long process of casting and financing like after the Kickstarter campaign that's really when I kind of finished the book um, wow. you know because you have time you know you you send a script out to an actor it could be two weeks or two mm -hmm. months or 20 years but by the time you hear back so you might as well be working on something so um, yeah, so anyway, so that's, that's the book. And so the book is really like a step-by-step -step guide from finding the material. Find, how do you find a play? How do you find, you know, I tell the whole Pfeiffer story. That's great. There, you know, uh, to, to, you know, casting, financing, crowdfunding, uh, actually directing on set. And, I, and again, like I had written a chapter on what do you do the first day on set? And I was like, uh, uh, make name tags for everyone. Hello, my name is, you mm -hmm. know you know, for safety build, and, yeah, build and, and a family. familiarity, build a family. And, and I was, and I just threw that in the book and then we tried it and it worked. And I was like, Oh, thank God it worked. Cause I just <laughs> put it in the book. You know? That's great. It's a real walkthrough. In a real yeah. And person. then, and then it goes into, you know, post-production. How do you fire your first editor? How do you hire your second editor? You know, how do, um, you know, wow. uh, and then, and then, you know, applying to festivals and navigating that, that thing and distribution. And there's a whole chapter on how to, do Hollywood meetings, you know, with your career, and so it really is everything from beginning to end. That's a great walkthrough. Yeah, I am even more excited. Cause yeah, to, and then there's little chapters, like little sidebar chapters, because I'm not famous. No one's seen my films, clearly, <laughs> but um, but there's little chapters with uh, uh, I call them name droppers, you know, on on like uh, you know Robert Altman, Harold Ramis, people that I have met, John Carpenter. You know, Christopher Nolan, the Russo brothers, Ryan Johnson, Lynn Shelton, you know, different people that I have met along the way because, of course, people have heard of them. You know? <laughs> so, and little stories I have from all of them. Mm. Wow. Now that's some great stuff. Yeah, Damn. Mm. Okay, if someone's just starting out in, a, in trying to get a career in filmmaking, like, yeah. and it could be anything, what, what's the things they shouldn't do or what's some advice? Don't date actresses or actors. Uh, they should marry a doctor or, or an entertainment lawyer. Not a bad idea because mm. then you never have to pay for your entertainment lawyer and you've married well. I mean, the key is to marry well. <laughs> However you define well mm -hmm. is up to you. The key is to marry well. Um, and, and somehow get yourself set up, you know, one way or another. Um, because you're never going to make money in this business. And if you are making money, it probably means you're not doing what you really want to be doing. Like, you know, you have yeah. a great day job, but then you don't have time to do your passion or yeah. vice versa. So, hmm. uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, or <laughs> there's that's some the, sense into that. That's the secret. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, there's different ways to go. I mean, you know, I went to film school, I went to grad school, but that's because my undergrad didn't have a film program. If you've, 
gone, if you're undergrad or high school for that matter, had a great film program, mm-hmm. you probably don't need to go to grad school. But the, but I think one little secret there is that there's a lot of really great programs in LA, in New York, probably in other places too, um, where you don't need to get a degree. But like, say you went to a great undergrad program and you learned how to do YouTube videos or something like that, or you've done a lot of those. Um, but you really want to learn screenwriting. Well, you don't have to get a full degree like UCLA Extension or Santa Monica College. You can just take a class Mm -hmm. on whatever it is, whatever skill set you need to break in. The other thing I would say advice-wise is that, broadly speaking, there's three ends of filmmaking or TV, for that matter, which is pre-production, production, and post-production, right? So, and I think... If you start in any one of those br- very broad three sections, you can move your way up in your career. So if you start in pre-production, like you start as an assistant to an agent, you can move over to a development executive. You can move from film to TV. You can, you know, a little bit. Um, but you're not going to get a post-production job. and No one's going to hire you as an editor for a film. Mm-hmm. Likewise, if you start as an assistant editor, oh, you can work your way up to an editor, you can work at a VFX place, you can work as a distribution company, you know, do trailers, different things like that, but no one's going to hire you to be a camera operator. You mm-hmm. know? Likewise, if you work up, work your way up on sets in production, if you have from a PA to second AD, you can work your way up into the, one of the director's guild or, the, or as an electrician, up to a DP, but you're not going to get hired as an agent. You know? So... I think that's something to be a little bit cognizant of when you are starting out is not so much what your specific job is, but broadly speaking, where is this job going to lead me to? Mm -hmm. And is it, am I going to get stuck in production or am I going to get stuck in pre-production? Am I going to get stuck in post? And stuck is a good, you know, it can be a good thing. That makes sense, yeah. If that's what you want to do. I was very lucky that the summer after my first year at film school, um, and film school is good in that it really does teach you you can learn everything from pre-production through Mm post-production you know any kind of film school undergrad grad even high school um but uh i was lucky i did get a job working on a really bad kickboxing movie in the philippines really that did take me from pre-production through post-production from uh, what were you doing on that everything Uh, (laughs) (laughs) uh i started as an intern for a week of shooting in la and then was doing working helping the production manager location scouting things like that and then the producer said oh dan you seem to be the only one who knows what's going on around here do you want to come to the philippines for five weeks and we'll make you second assistant director and and pay you four hundred dollars a week and i asked the only question one should ask in that situation which is is there a return ticket and there was and i saw it and i was like okay yes i'll go so yes i spent five weeks in the philippines (laughs) as second assistant director but because it was a Hungarian director and so uh, and the screenwriter had been my screenwriting professor at USC he couldn't go with so he had told the director oh if you need anyone to punch up dialogue or write new scenes Dan can do that so I did some of that I was the dialogue coach that must have been a hell of an experience it was crazy yeah and and there's an old adage you learn more from working on a bad movie than you do from working on, on a good movie and I learned a lot. Let's just put it that way. And then at the end, the producer said, oh, do you want to come back to L.A.? Yes, I do. And and be the, the post supervisor. So I was like, terrific. Heck yeah. What's a post supervisor? And said, <laughs> yeah, well, you yes. Gotta, and what do yes. I have to do? And so he said, well, you just said the main thing is you have to find us an, an edit suite. So I found this porn company at the time uh, that had an extra room with a, a flatbed and, and some upright moviolas. And, and I remember the name of the company it was called Miracle Films. And their motto was, if it's a good film, it's a miracle. And, uh, but they were very nice people. And so then I became an assistant editor, too, because we were cutting the thing in three weeks with three different shifts of editors and assistant editors. So I learned how to edit, you know. Wow. And, um, and so I got back to school, you know, at the, in, in September. And I was like, I just learned so how much. to make a movie. Yeah, you learned so much. I was like, if these crazy people can do it all speaking different languages in the Philippines, like, how hard can it be? So then for my senior year, I figured out the loophole at USC where I could make uh, an independent feature. And I was the first one to do that at SC and, uh, and, and still own it myself and, and, you know, find, you know, raise money from private equity. And, mm. and w- where did you stay in the Philippines or where did you guys shoot? Uh, mostly Manila. And then there was some other place, really pretty beach place farther south. I don't remember where okay. it was, but Manila wow. was a, cool. an interesting place. Have yeah. You been to the yeah. Philippines? I lived there for nine months. That's what oh, was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, you no, know. uh, I, no, I didn't it's go human. to Manila. I, I was in Cebu. Okay. Uh, mainly in, in Dumaguete. Wow. But uh, I think I made it there. very cool. 
Wow. So anyway, huh. so if you get those opportunities, take them. I mean, that's the other thing too. Like, I mean, that I only found out about that thing because there was a bulletin, there was a notice on the bulletin board. I had already gotten a, a summer internship doing reading coverage in an air conditioned office for no money, which is what most of my friends were doing, um, which is okay. But it's but not. It's not trip. Yeah. But I, the reason I noticed this is there was a flyer on the bulletin board that said interns needed for one week in LA terrorist filmmaking. And I thought, huh, I've heard of guerrilla filmmaking. Whoa. I've never heard of terrorist filmmaking. That's cool. And then, so I was just curious enough to call the number. And, uh, and it turned out that, you know, the guy with a Hungarian accent answers the phone. He says, <laughs> hello. And I go, yeah. What is this terrorist filmmaking? Oh, yes, I meant to write guerrilla filmmaking, but my dictionary was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so you just kind of have yeah, to take a dive. Keep your eyes open and for bulletin boards. it's not like, you know, and, and that's the thing, too. Like, you can't get too hung up like, oh, I must work on a Wes Anderson film or yeah. nothing, you know. Yeah. No, or kind of kickboxing movie from time to time you know so you wait how did learn it a lot. when you finished you guys finished the movie and you you watched it like what were your thoughts the kickboxing yeah. movie oh my gosh i was like first of all i look great with slick back hair because of course i had to act in it a couple of times i got shot in the <laughs> chest twice yes in the in the that's, film that's which the is, beauty of the indie, indie it is yeah, yeah you can be in the movies you can be, the yeah no they needed as many white guys as they could find and i so i played that role twice um <laughs> But no, but I, it, but it was really like, it was a nice awakening, like, okay, making a feature film is, is doable, you know, and this is, this is 35 millimeter. This is not digital. Like the, the means of production were more complicated and more expensive then than they are now. But it was, um, but I was like, okay, if these guys can make this film in the Philippines and LA, like, and this was in the early nineties and it was when Robert Rodriguez and it was, you know, was making, um, uh, uh, El Mariachi. El Mariachi, yeah. And, uh, and, and Linklater was making Slacker. And, you know, these guys oh, in movie. Austin oh, were making God, these films. I thought, well, why not just go back to Omaha, which is kind of my version of Austin. You know, that's where I grew up. And I, and I knew local actors there. And I, I figured I could try to, and I knew the locations. And so I just spent 10 days, wrote a script that could take place in Nebraska. A friend of mine told me about Carhenge, this crazy place in western Nebraska with old American cars you know, recreated to make Stonehenge. And I thought, well, the, great. I just need to start in Omaha and in Carhenge and there's a go. movie. And, um, and it's not a great film, but it's a pretty decent film, you know? And, uh, and we just started raising money. Locally. That was your first one. Yeah. That was my first film. And, and what was, was it called again? Omaha, the movie. Omaha, the, the, the movie. movie. Oh, Omaha, that's the full wow. the movie. Okay. Yeah. And we're actually about to have our, uh, 25th anniversary reunion screening in Omaha on August 18th um, with the cast. And wow, cool. that sounds. Uh, yeah, 25 years since since we shot it. Um, yeah, cause we shot it in '93. Um, but you know, look, it, that movie led to a lot of interesting things. Not, I mean, the investors have have made literally like each one made eight dollars and forty two cents so far. Yeah, that's like that's the record. But I mean, most it took me 20 years anything. before I wrote them a check. Or in some cases, they're heirs. Wow. But our biggest living investor on that was, uh, he did well. He became Secretary of Defense, Chuck Hagel. Um, he's done well. And he was very happy with getting that check for $8.42. <laughs> That's a story. Very supportive guy. Wow. Um, one of our PAs was Ryan Johnson, who's done okay with hmm. Last Jedi, you know. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, and his and our camera assistant that same day was Steve Yedlin, who's now an ASC cinematographer who shot The Last Jedi. Um, oh, you know, that shit. film kind of set the the model for Alexander Payne uh, to start shooting his films in Omaha. So Alex has done pretty well for himself, um, and and that's the film that started Slamdance. You know, really? Yeah, I mean, we because we didn't get in Sundance. So, so we, we talk a little bit about that, please. Oh, yeah. I'd love to hear more. Uh, yeah, and now. Slam dance is like you're slamming Sundance, right? Is that what's happening? Yeah, basically we. <laughs> yeah, F I had Sundance. Yeah, because we, you know, in the in the early '90s, so '90 we started Slam Dance January '95. Um, it was '94, '95 was kind of a pivotal year in independent film. Now, that was kind of the year that Miramax just sold to um, uh, to Disney. Uh, Warner Brothers just bought out uh, fi um, uh, Fine Line. Um, you know, Fine Line had become part of Warner Brothers. Fox was launching Fox Searchlight. And uh, and it was kind of the, the era of the beginning of the Hollywoodization of independent film. 
And because of that, Sundance kind of went along for the ride. They're like, oh, well, we should show films by, you know, seasoned directors, second time, third time directors, and films with big name actors and big budgets and get, you know, Harvey Weinstein to be our sponsor and things like that. And so they kind of left behind the, the, the niche of the first time directors, which had been kind of the hallmark of Sundance yeah, for that's its what first it was. few years, you know. And all of us had been influenced by that first generation of, you know, of, of Witt Stillman and, and Steven Soderbergh and, and Linkletter and Rodriguez and, and those guys. So, um, so when we came along, they didn't take any of our films, you know, these first time indie films, especially from Nebraska. And so we said, well, why don't we get a dozen feature directors and a dozen short directors, combine our resources and, and show up in Park City. And, and there had been the previous year, I should say, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, those guys, they their first film, uh, uh, Cannibal the Musical, which is a great film, didn't get into Sundance. And they did their own little renegade screening in Park City. And then there's another filmmaker named... Uh, James Marandino is a good friend. Uh, he did a film called The Upstairs Neighbor separately, also didn't get into Sundance, did his own little renegade screening. And those guys kind of separately had gotten a little bit of press. So we thought, why don't we take that model, but really turn it into a collective, you know, get a dozen fil you know, features and a dozen shorts and, and, and combine resources and show up in Park City. And that's, that's essentially what we did. And we named it Slam Dance because we were, <laughs> it looked better on a t-shirt than Loser Fest 95, which was my <laughs> original idea. You know, so, um, and, then, and then really within that first week, we decided, you know what, that we're filling a niche f that could be here next year too. So we, we put down a deposit, my friend Peter Baxter, who's now our executive director at Slam Dance, he, we, he had a credit card so we use that and uh and reserve space for the next year and we've been doing it now we're heading into our 25th year wow so so where so from z from the beginning till now like where is slam dance now if, if there's a scale is there like a measurement you can well yeah yeah no exactly right so we measure our success because uh i mean we've we've certainly had i mean first of all We've stuck with the mantra, at least for our competition films, they have to be first-time directors, low budgets, and, and no distribution in place. And that was kind of a way to distinguish ourselves from Sundance and also from other festivals that have kind of come and in many cases gone since then. Um, so because of that, our, our biggest success, and it is interesting that festivals in general, their metric for success used to be how many of our films are getting picked up for distribution. Mm -hmm. That was what Sundance used as their measurement for success. That's what South by used to use. You know, that's what Toronto used as their measure of success for a while. Now, the metric for success that most festivals use, or the, these big festivals, A-list festivals, or B minus or whatever, um, is how many of our films are getting awards, are getting Oscars, mm. and that's something that I don't think independent filmmakers have realized. That wait, these festivals don't care about films without distribution and will it get distribution they care about is the next best picture nominee you know coming out of toronto or coming out of telluride or coming out of venice or coming out of sundance um that's a weird interesting thing hmm. anyway to answer your question i think um for slam dance we kind of measure our success not so much by the success of the individual films that have come out although we've certainly had some success paranormal activity was a slam dance film. Whoa. Uh, that got picked up at Slam Dance. Very cool. And, the uh, first one. No, oh. it wasn't. Oh. No, oh, no okay. not at all. It wasn't the first one. It was probably the most successful. One. I mean, the first par uh, paranormal activity. Oh, yes, just the like first the paranormal one. activity. Yeah. Wow. And in fact, it wasn't that much of an announcement because at the time, Warren Pelly, who's a great guy, was there with the film. And the announcement was that it was getting picked up by DreamWorks uh, or Spielberg uh, for remake rights. So it was like, oh, okay, that's nice. You know, it's a nice little <laughs> announcement goes in the back of the press release. And then and then it was months later that Spielberg actually watched the film. He's like, oh, no, no, no we actually want to, you know, we want to tweak the ending or whatever. But put it out basically as is. Wow. And so that. Um, is he back there? No. No, he's not here. Okay. Oh, someone's asking for June. Uh, I don't know who that June's is. the owner. Oh, okay. He's a big okay. supporter of mine. Great. Um, so, uh, but, but. What is kind of the metric of success that we use is how successful have our individual filmmakers become then on their subsequent films, because that's Slam is really a discovery festival. I mean, look, your first films aren't always going to be that great, but 
they should show promise. So mm-hmm. we have shown the first films of Ryan Johnson, Christopher Nolan, the Russo brothers, um, uh, well, Oren Pelly, um, Napoleon Dynamite starters as Slam Man Short. Uh, we showed uh, uh, Lynn, uh, Lynn Shelton's first film, uh, Lena Dunham's first film. Um, the list goes really on and on. Ben Zeitlin, we showed his first couple of shorts before he did Beast of the Southern Wild. Um, uh, uh, Sean Baker, um, the Safdie brothers, the Zellner brothers, pretty much any brothers out there, the Dowdle brothers, <laughs> uh, literally, like every brother that's great. set since the Cone brothers, you know. Um, and, uh, and so we've added up, like our combined alumni grosses are over $16 billion with their subsequent films, billion with a B. Uh, you know, I mean, the Russos just added, you know, two billion the other day, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and, and what's interesting, too, is it's not just that, OK, these are filmmakers that kind of, you know, popped in and out. Mm-hmm. You know, we saw them for a week and then they disappeared from our lives. Now, mm-hmm. Slamdance is also unique in that our programming is done by alumni. So Ryan Johnson was a programmer for a year. He helped pick the Russo brothers. That's film. great. The Russos helped pick Christopher Nolan's film. Uh, which I talk about in the book. There's actually, there's some interesting drama in the book about that, um, which has not been revealed hitherto. Ooh. So you gotta read the book to find okay. out yes. how the book. Russos affected Chris Nolan's career. Uh, Chris, not so much Chris, but his wife, Emma, who's his producing partner, she was a programmer for two or three years at Slam Dance. And the Russos did it for three years, three or four years. So, I mean, uh, and they've all come back as alumni or been yeah, involved special. one way or another. Um, uh, so yeah, so it's it, it is it, it becomes this family, this community, and that's the other thing too that I would say is one way or another try to create your own community or become part of a community, an alumni group, a filmmaker group, a festival group. Mm. Uh, you know, you've met people on the planes that you're now collaborating with. Yeah, you know, right. So, um, and and in my case, I mean, almost all of my friends. And one way or another, come from Slam Dance. Many of my collaborators, even Bernard and Huey, I met my producer and my DP both at Slam Dance. Um, you know, I've met a number of cast people at Slam Dance over the years. Um, I've met on my previous film, I met my DP at Slam Dance. Uh, Chris wow. Nolan met Wally Fister at Slam Dance. You know, and they were collaborators for years together. Um, you know, so it's really, it's a, uh, that the fest you know so that's kind of how we measure our success Mm -hmm. so it's not which is good because it also lowers expectations like okay maybe you'll get distribution i got distribution for my film bernard and huey at the festival this year uh uh, i was a closing night film which by the way was out of competition (laughs) and i had to pay my entry fee good like everybody else (laughs) and submit my film to the committee which was not clear <laughs> until I got in until that it would get hey, in. That's but anyway, but so it was playing out of competition, but it was a closing night film and we sure enough we got to we did get distribution. Which that was, is very cool. Which was pretty amazing. So yeah, fifty percent of our out of competition films got picked up for distribution at the festival this year, which was actually a better percentage than Sundance. So, so let me ask yeah. now when's the next deadline to submit for Slam Dance and, and how do people out there with films that are looking to yeah. submit what, what do they do? Uh, if you have a film go to I think uh, Without a Box uh, or go to the Slam Dance website um, I, It's w- there's kind of different deadlines depending on if you know you pay less if it's the early deadline the late deadline the middle deadline but more or less by September I think you kind of need to have it okay, done it's, it's similar deadlines to Sundance and but is it, uh, you have to submit to both. You can't wait until you don't get into Sundance because by then we've made our decisions already. A lot of people still don't know that, so, mm. which is kind of remarkable. But wow. anyway, uh, but yeah. And is, do you accept shorts as well or is it just Oh, features? absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and some of our biggest successes are shorts. I mean, Napoleon Dynamite oh, started yeah, as ran, a slam and short. And That's cool. Lena Dunham short and Ben Seitlin shorts. So, uh, so yeah, we show a lot of shorts, uh, definitely. Okay. And, do- and documentaries, animation, and oh, and it's an Oscar qualifying festival for shorts, which which is a big deal. Cool. You know? So if you win your category of shorts, that makes you Oscar qualified. Wow. Yeah. Now, when all this awesomeness is overwhelming for you, like what do you what do you do to recharge and just kind of lose track of time, take a break? What, what do you do? <laughs> yeah. What do you do? Well, I try to go to film festivals in nice places. You know. Barbados, hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's where I went in January, and I'm actually heading back there oh, okay. to collaborate. They have a collaboration grant for 
international filmmakers to work with local filmmakers. I'm going back there in August to work on a, on a short. Wow. That's hey, pretty that's, nice. It's cool. To, I actually, I, um, Ryan Connolly, a previous guest of mine, he said he recharges by going out and shooting shorts and it's funny. So you're that recharging going to collaborate with. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, it is good. I think, uh, between features cause it can take, look, five years between features is quick. And that's what I was in my last one. Uh, so it is good to like keep honing your shooting and editing skills mm. or directing skills um, by doing shorts. So that is true. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I mean, look, most of my time is, is devoted to driving my kids around Culver City, you know. Now when school, that goes so. crazy, what do you do to recharge? Like, is there any I special? I come to the coffee shop and work on films. Okay. So. <laughs> so, okay, great. Yeah. You say it twice. Then uh, we know. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, you, <laughs> that's cool. you try to lead a normal life, you know, I mean, cause that's the thing too, like you, uh, you know, life goes on very quickly while you're waiting for five years or seven years to make a feature. So don't, don't be so single minded that you're doing that, that you forget to, you know, buy real estate or, <laughs> you know, which by the you way, have other endeavors. Yeah. Or yeah. family or, you know, family obligations or different things like that. So, uh, because that stuff will go on around you, whether you want it to or not. So, you know, don't get stuck at 55, you know, single alone, still renting, you know, uh, I know plenty of filmmakers, even if they haven't married well, they've bought well. Mm. Yeah. And, I know you, you got to consider these real things. estate artists you know. out there. Like it, it, art b rarely makes you money. Right. I mean, uh, no, I mean, my, can, my, but my father-in-law was a watercolor artist, but was very smart in the late sixties, early seventies, bought property in Venice, yeah. you know? Oh my gosh. I wish um, I was and he's now able to still doing art and living in Santa Fe. But yeah. the point was if, you know, he was smart enough to, um, you know, do get into real estate. I know, I know a lot of filmmakers that have done that too, you know, just for practical reasons. Oh, I need an apartment. And my friend Paul Rackman, like was very smart, bought his apartment in New York in, you know, 1988, you know, or something like that. And, you know, he's lived in LA, but rented out the apartment. He's moved back to the apartment in New York. I mean, you know, got married and owns this place. That's now worth way more than when he bought it and it's paid off. Yeah. You know? So, um, Similarly, my wife and I bought a place in Culver City w when nobody cared what Culver City was. Mm. Like, yeah. Century City? What? No. <laughs> Studio City? No. Yeah. Now, uh, now yeah, it's, it's it's definitely Culver place. City now. Yeah. Everyone so knows. buy a place in Inglewood. Oh, that's coming up. Yeah. I, I went to visit places over there recently. Yeah. And I was surprised because I never took like a little tour. I just heard Inglewood and I just remembered like some of the rumors. Hey, you know, it's slummy, but... It's coming up and, and it's, oh, it's yeah. not bad. There's yeah. some beach wind also that creeps in. Oh, yeah. So it's pretty. No, absolutely. Yeah, no, a friend of mine, uh, I don't know if he owns it, but he he renovated a theater there and uses it for um, uh, for films, but also music performances there. And he got it just at the right time and it's like this hot place and he's having a blast doing it. Mm. Um, but yeah, but that's, you know, you know, buy in Brooklyn before it turns into Brooklyn or. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. You know, I don't know. I don't know New York, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, that's the other thing. It's just, yeah, don't forget to live life. And part of living life is traveling, you know, and seeing the world. And, and that's what I really like about film festivals is that, you know, people get really obsessed with these A-list festivals, you know, even Slam Dance, you know, like, oh, I must wait six months until I get into this, you know, until I can world premiere my film with this, you know, Toronto or Sundance and then you don't get in and then you wait another six months to try for South by or Tribeca or whatever. Meanwhile, there's 3000 other festivals around the world that would kill to have your film, mm -hmm. you know, so you've got to, and they're in amazing places around the world. I mean, it's, you know, yeah, it's not for nothing. I've cool. gone to Oldenburg, Germany four or five times and, and Barbados and Trinidad and, and Bahamas festival and, um, you know, and you're meeting amazing filmmakers. I was in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil this year. I was in Alaska, you know. That's great. Uh, the film went to Guam. The film went to Japan. You know, I wasn't able to go to all those places, but the ones you can go to, that's, great, that's, where, that's, that's where you meet other filmmakers. That's the real secret is that's where you meet collaborators. And, and unique. And, I mean, people you wouldn't meet here oh, yeah. where you're yeah, at. Yeah, Germans, you're at. Brazilians, Caribbeans. I'm yeah. going to be collaborating with a Barbados filmmaker in Very a couple cool. months. Uh, you know, I was in... Athens at a festival spending 
three days with Whit Stillman, one of my idols, and I learned so much from him. You know, like this is where you, you know, hanging out with Kubrick's producer, Jimmy Harris, you know, for three days in Germany. Like, yeah. you don't get you don't get that. Just Otherwise, by not going. Yeah, yeah, you have to get out there. Yeah, exactly. You know, you just mentioned, like, you got to live life and you got to do things. Um, when when life passes and you have a gravestone, what do you think you would like written on there? You know, I was just thinking about that, not for me, but for, I wonder if, uh, I was wondering if um, Larry David. He's a favorite of mine. Yeah, if on his gravestone it's going to say, pretty dead, pretty <laughs> dead. That would be great. That would be good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, but for me, I don't know. Okay. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> yeah, because the guy that changed the rules of the Academy Awards, I, I don't know if that will fit because, like, y- your family has to pay by the engraving, <laughs> you know? So that's not really... Okay. Um, yeah, no. And, I mean, the funny thing is, is uh, I mean, I don't know about gravestones, but certainly in quick introductions or short bios, mm-hmm. you know, like, uh, you know, you can say... You know, you start off as an award-winning filmmaker. All it takes is one award to become exactly. an award-winning filmmaker. If you're not an award-winning filmmaker, then you're a critically acclaimed filmmaker. You know, if you're not, um, <laughs> so you go from critically acclaimed filmmaker to award-winning filmmaker. You know, maybe you get to Sundance-winning filmmaker, uh, maybe a Spirit Award-nominated filmmaker. Then maybe you get to be an Oscar-nominated filmmaker. But then everybody still knows you're a loser. You know. Um, <laughs> You know, even, uh, uh, you know, Jules Pfeiffer, you know, this 89-year-old American legend, you know, Oscar winner, Pulitzer winner, two-time Obie winner, you know, better than an EGOT, that's a poo. Uh, But he doesn't have an EGOT, so now that's the metric everyone uses, you know. (laughs) But he's unique, you know, so you, so, and a Tony nominee, so if if you go Pulitzer, Oscar, Obie, Obie, Tony nominee, that's a Putin. Mm. no one else has a Putin, you know. So, uh, and now he has an award from Japan, too. Uh, so, yeah, at some point you just rack these things up, you know. But, uh, but yeah, I have a friend who's an Oscar nominee, and I was like, dude, everyone knows you're a loser. Because you know, if you were a winner, it, you would say, everyone would call you an Oscar winner. You know, <laughs> uh, you know or like true. my friend Bill Plimpton, you know, amazing animator, two time Oscar nominee. It's like, oh, poor Bill. <laughs> Um, you know, but like he's an American legend too. Yeah. Know? So you can't, that's why at some point it's, you can't get a, too obsessed about that stuff. It's about the work. And, mm-hmm. and the other thing too, like you can't, you can't worry. I mean, I, there was a, and I talk about this in the book a little bit, like on the last page of the book, you got to make it to the end of the book. <laughs> um, I was at a great panel at South by in 1995 when my first film Omaha the movie was playing there and it was only the second year of South by but there was this panel and it, it had Steven Soderbergh and Richard Linkletter and I think uh, 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 Michael Moore and and Robert Rodriguez and I don't know, um, uh, all these amazing people and the last one on there was uh, was Greg Araki who had uh, Doom Generation was playing at the festival and all these guys were talking about these amazing stories. Well, when I was at Sundance and I sold the film to Javi and, you know, whatever it was. And, and, they, and they had these, you know, hit the ball out of the park, right? You know, and just had these amazing first films that did amazingly well. Um, and at the end of the panel, you know, Greg Araki says, well, I've made, you know, Doom Generation was his fifth film. He had made four films up until that point for like $20,000, $40,000, $50,000, you know, it's, um, Super 16 or whatever. Um, and none of, none of those films had done that well. They didn't get into Sundance. They didn't get distribution. They didn't, you know, or, but they, each one did a little better than the one before. Mm-hmm. And finally, by his fifth film, he was on the same panel with these guys. He had an $800,000 budget. He made this fantastic award-winning film, you know, had French investors, and he was literally on the same panel with this other pantheon of the great indie filmmakers. Hey, Jim. And, um... And he said, you know, you can either hit it, the ball out of the park the first time at bat, or at some point you just build a career. And eventually you'll get acknowledged for that career, for that body of work. Mm-hmm. Not for the each, each individual work, but for the body of work. At some point people will recognize, oh wait, this person's pretty consistently good. growing. Yeah, yeah, and doing That's well good. each time, you know. And, um, that's a good point. You know, you don't have to just, you can't always hit a home run right on the first exactly. time you hit. Yeah. You got to swing, you got to 
get better at and, and you know muscles yeah. in your arms get to grow yep. so yeah yeah and and if you think about some of the great filmmakers we know that's their first films weren't necessarily their best films mm-hmm. you know but um but they developed their craft and their skills and and they stuck to it you know and eventually people recognize oh wait this person when they say they're going to make a film they make the film that's, that's all that it takes to a big part of it you yeah know, um is that that level of commitment and follow-through you know mm. so uh so that was i don't remember what the question was oh well, why don't you tell us where everyone can find you, websites, and just Oh, kinda... yeah. So, uh, yeah, danmervish.com is kind of where I, that's my sort of home base. Um, and then, but I'm also, I'm pretty active on Twitter, at Dan Mervish, and then Facebook. I've, I've got too many friends. I've got, I'm up to 5,000, but you can follow me on Facebook. Okay. Um, and then I'm not on Instagram. I don't have to figure that out, um, or Snapchat or anything too hip like that uh and then yeah and then for slam dance stuff go to slam dance um for uh, to check out the book the cheerful service of god to independent filmmaking uh the easiest is to buy that on amazon yeah um, i'll put it. all this in the show notes as yeah, well yeah, yeah. for anyone listening uh, and then uh i'm thinking of doing a, an audio version of it i haven't done that yet but it is you can get the electronic version okay um or just buy it um and then my films, Bernard and Huey, that is available on iTunes. Uh, Between Us is available on Amazon, I know. Um, Omaha the Movie is available on Amazon. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, and then if you're in New Jersey tonight, go see the film in New Jersey. Also next week, right? Also next week, next Sunday Great. in New Jersey. Or in Anchorage, we're going to be playing at the Beartooth Theater Pub uh, next week week and about a week and a half in Anchorage excellent uh, and if you're in Nebraska I will be I'll be there August f- uh, 16th we're showing Omaha the movie in Omaha August 17th we're showing it sorry not no we're showing Bernard and Huey on the 16th in Omaha we're showing Bernard and Huey on the 17th in Lincoln playing for a week there and then I'm back on the 18th back in Omaha to do show Omaha the movie and then I'm hopefully going to be doing some guest lectures that's the other thing too hmm. uh, that I've been doing a lot more. I've, I've guest lectured at about twenty five different colleges and universities around the world. Great, and um, and and I I enjoy that. I, I have a lot of fun with it, and occasionally they pay. So, um, uh, yeah, very good. So that's, hopefully, well, I'll be doing more of that this fall. I have uh, two quick last questions. Yeah, you might. Go All right, uh, whatever comes to mind. What's one word that you're constantly working on? or improving for your yourself in life? One word that I'm constantly improving. Or working at to... to working at. Posture. Posture. That can mean many things. That can be physical, that can mean mental, right? Yeah. Yeah, see? I like it. How that works. I just straightened up my back, by I the know, way. Yeah, just, no, I should do that too. Yeah. That's a great one. I yeah. love that. I have it's, not heard that one. Great. Yeah, yeah. I should use that. And... Uh, what, what about, is there one step someone could take right now if, if they want to drive at their passions? Like today, something that doesn't take months to develop, is something they can just, one little thing. One little thing that they could do is to buy my book. Available on Amazon, wherever fine books are sold. Um, <laughs> okay. Yes. Great. Please. <laughs> I, yeah, guys, it, it yeah. looks, uh, from I've skimmed through it, talking with Dan, talking to another yeah. person that reviewed it, it is great, if yeah. it's especially... Uh, if you're trying to make your film. <laughs> right, <laughs> I mean. yeah. Um, but also there's a lot of accompanying videos on um, on my website. Actually, we were talking about Open House earlier. A lot of the making of that stuff ties in with um, uh, uh, with the book, stuff on the, in the book, actually. Uh, and, and so that's all kind of tied together on the website. So you can watch some of those videos. But, um, Great. but yeah, otherwise just, you know, go do the thing you want to do. But... Also, don't do the thing that other people want you to do. Like if, uh, oh, and the other, the other last bit of advice I'll say is don't get hung up on the medium. We're in a very fluid era of, you know, TV's the hot thing this year, you know, webisodes and web series and podcasts and, you know, feature films are almost passe now. Um, don't get hung up on that. Like if you've got a great idea or a great or a unique style, like it's got to have you've got to be unique about something or a great character. Uh, figure it out, but don't get hung up on oh, it must be a ninety-minute 
feature or it must be a 10 webisode 10 episode series of a webisode or it must be mm-hmm. a pilot for TV shows no if it's good it's good and depending on who you're pitching it to just tell them it's something different you know I, that's great uh, it may be a novel and maybe you'll get paid more I mean that's what happened to me that's why I wrote that novel hmm. that was supposed to be a TV pitch wow but we got paid to write a novel and we did you know it's like alright <laughs> you know or a bunch of articles turned into a nonfiction book Great. Yeah, so many ways. So don't get uh, don't get hung up on the medium. Okay. Yeah, I love it. Well, thank you so much, Dan. No, thank you. Tony. I really appreciate your time here. Sure, man. Yeah, come to the and thank you to the Spot Cafe and Lounge yes. here in Culver City. All right. Well, have a wonderful day. Will do. And Thanks. everyone listening, check the show notes on www.unfakeittillyoumakeit.com. Also, for new listeners, every Sunday that's when I release a new episode. And with that, I also have a free newsletter I've been sending out to subscribers, which is called Smorgasbord Sunday. And it's a weekly menu, including the latest episode, along with a bunch of cool stuff I hunt and gather during the week to optimize professional and personal growth in the entertainment industry and the so-called life. Wonderful things, but not limited to unique tools, industry hacks, inspirational excerpts, Songs that I've been listening to on repeat during my writing sessions. Powerful quotes and any magical doohickey I uncover. If you'd like to sign up, just go to unfakeittillyoumakeit.com and click the podcast section and you can enter your email there. It is definitely a fun thing for me to put together and I enjoy doing it to set up my week and ensure that I'm on the right path. Thank you so much, guys, and farewell. Thank you for listening to the Unfake It Till You Make It podcast. For detailed sources and show notes for this episode, visit www.unfakeittillyoumakeit.com. Until next time, get up, get going, and get creative. <laughs>